Good morning. Um, while we're waiting for other people to come in and join us this morning, I would like to ask Jason and Stuart to unmute yourselves so we can start introducing our fabulous speakers this morning. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Good morning, Stuart. Morning. Yeah. How's it going? Loud and clear. Fantastic. So we this morning we are here talking about designing distilleries. It's a, a presentation we had with Stuart Falconer from Michael Laird's Architects at the Zampop Up Glasgow last September. And it was so interesting, we decided to turn it into a virtual panel so that we could have a larger audience listening to Stuart's notes. And we added Jason to kind of complement uh, this panel. So Stuart is an architect from Michael Laird. Jason uh, is a crea creative director of Contagious Design. So we'll, we will have a different approach and a different point of view to the to the to the process of designing distilleries and uh, spaces for the drinks industry. So as a little um, presentation, I would like to go through the uh, profiles of uh, Jason Stewart. We start with Stewart. Um, Stewart is joined as an associate uh, Michael Laird's architect in 2017 after setting up and running a successful architecture studio in Glasgow in Edinburgh for 11 years. Um, after graduating from University of Strathclyde with a first class honours degree and master's degree with distinction, he worked on a wide range of projects on various scales for private, public and commercial clients in the UK and overseas. Stuart is responsible for delivering several projects within the office with a particular focus on creativity and design. He has a holistic design approach and prides himself on maintaining excellent client relationships. In addition, he has a strong passion for understanding a successful implementation of project briefs regardless of size and type. On the, his other side, Jason... <laughs> Jason Milne, Creative Director at Contagious, from retail designer in London for brands like Virgin, Tesco and Marx Spencer to industry award winner for creativity, experience and design effecti effectiveness, lecturer at Moonshine University in Kentucky, where his work can be sorry, where his work can be found in distilleries, brand homes, airports, and bars worldwide, including Aberfeldy, Islay, Dublin, London, Louisville, Manhattan, and Texas. So you, you travel a lot, travel around quite a lot, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I used to. Starting to do it again now. Yeah. Uh, good. Jason and his team specialize in brand experiences that help turn customers into advocates who return time and again and want to share their brand experience with others. So we kick off, we both, Jason and Stuart, have got the presentation for us today. So we start with Stuart, followed by Jason, and then we have our Q&A session. So get your questions ready. I'll stop presenting my slides so I can leave space for Stuart. Here you go. Stuart, the floor is all yours. No problem. Thanks, Sarah. Um, just let me get the technical stuff right. OK, so can everyone see the screen? No problem at all. OK, well, thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, as, as suggested, I'm, I'm project, architect, uh, project director at Michael Laird Architects. Uh, we've worked in quite a lot of distillery buildings and other drinks industry buildings recently. And, and as Sarah said, when presented us in Glasgow, we just thought it's some, some of the more um, really interesting work that we do in the office. And, and it was just uh, nice, actually, on a personal level, to be able to share some of this. Um, I'm excited today to, to be able to, to share it with Jason. Um, there's a lot of similarities in, in what we do, and there's quite a lot of differences as well. So Jason, hopefully, is going to jump in and, and heckle me as we go through this presentation. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, feel free. It's not a problem at all. Um, so the following presentation, um, it's the way um, we're presenting this is really running through the key design stages rather than a project by project basis. I think it's quite nice to be able to share just how we do these things. I'm sure there's a few designers and architects um, on the call who maybe recognise some of these or maybe do things differently. And again, at the end of the presentation, more than happy to, to hear about some of that. But the primary focus is obviously on um, largely on, on the whiskey industry. Um, 
So before we get into that, there's just a wee intro on, on MLA. Some of you may know um, we've got two offices, one in Glasgow and one in Edinburgh. It's fair to say the bigger one is in is Edinburgh on the left here. And we actually managed to grow through the through the pandemic, um, which which was obviously good news for us. Um, there's about 75 in total, 20, 25 of which are, are in Glasgow um, in the Merchant City area. Uh, I'm based in Edinburgh, Edinburgh myself. Um, we do a lot of work, a lot of um, different kinds of work in different sectors, uh, from offices, residential, education, retail, conservation, leisure, industrial, and, and of course the, the, the drinks industry. Um, we also have sort of three main sectors to the office. Um, obviously architecture, we have got a very strong interiors um, department, which focus a lot on workspace design. And we also have a sort of strategic workplace consultancy uh, arm to the office as well. Um, Self-promo done, a uh, bit of process comparison now. Uh, so what I thought would be quite interesting to do was overlap the, the, the design process within what we do in the office with the the distilling process um it's fair to say i wasn't and i'll admit wasn't hugely familiar with the distilling process um when i began some of this project work but you, you learn very quickly and you realize that it's just a sequence of steps and when we were fir first thinking about how we might present this um i thought it was really interesting to compare the two now okay the steps are different different thing happens but essentially it's it's a process that you follow um we all I'm, i'll not teach everyone um how to distill but uh as a basic diagram along the top here and i've i've, I've just spliced that in alongside uh, the the stages of the the, the riba technical and the riba plan of work and those who may notice i've chopped off a couple of stages here um, at the front and the back of the, the, the purely for effect, really, to compare it to the six stages of the of the distilling process, um, and there is there is a reason for that. Um, quite often, number seven gets gets forgotten about, and 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 number zero as well, and, and stage zero as well. But um, I'll come back to that a wee bit later on. What I think those two initial diagrams didn't really um, portray is that it, it sort of suggests it's a bit of a linear process now. To my mind, um, it's much. This is a much better diagram. This is also that I believe plan of work, but it's very much a, a circular process and about repeating. Um, those familiar with the design industry, you know, you're constantly refining and trying to make it better and better and better. And I guess it's the same with distilling. You're trying to refine that product and make it as good as you possibly can, and testing, refining, trying again, and, and until we get to end that process. I guess Jason, it's probably very similar for yeah. yourself. Um, repeating was a word that I use quite a lot. Iteration. Um, these are the kind of words we're familiar with. We do it for the love of it, for sure. Um, oh, my screen's just gone blank for a second. Um, so yeah, so for so for me. It's, this is quite linear, doesn't really tell the story. This is very much about, in my mind, how, how the two processes are, are compatible. Um, so project locations, again, we talked about how Jason flies over the world. I guess you could say I'm a little bit more local from that point of view. Here's some of the, the projects we've worked on, um, well, some of the ones that I can talk about, certainly, um, in, in Scotland. Um, what, what I love about these projects, and I'm sure most of you are aware, are, are all of these projects are very unique to their to their site, um, often next to water uh, for obvious reasons, and very strong connections to historic and cultural environments. Um, to me, that's it's not just about where the building is, but about the connection to that to that local place. Um, so for us, that's really what sets apart some of these projects from some of the other work we do in the office. Um, here are some uh, it's a graphic view. Because you invited it, Stuart, just to chip in. Uh, yes. I mean that you'll you'll find with our, our our presentation as well, and all the products behind me. That it's obviously that's really important to the product as well about these projects is the provenance of where the, the product comes from and how it's made, and that's uh, that's kind of really important thing about design and facilities too. Absolutely, Jason. Thanks for that. And and here are some of the projects we've completed and some, well, fair to say, they're all in different stages. The two pink ones there are the ones that we have a bit of a, an overlap with, with Jason, um, which we'll, we can, I don't know how much we're allowed to talk about Jason, but they are certainly uh, <laughs> the ones we've, uh, we have met uh, together. 
We can talk about them. I'm just not allowed to show any images of them yet, uh, even though the projects are um, about three and four years old. So, uh, which is quite frustrating. Which is one of the frustrating things about these projects. <laughs> Indeed. Um, what I would say about these projects is that there's a, there's all of them are either a new distillery and visitor centre, existing distillery and a visitor centre, or just a visitor centre, um, which is what we've been involved in. So the common factor for me is really um, distilleries are, are are changing to the extent that it's it's the the importance of the visitor and and. Uh, previously, you know, distillers were, were functional beasts and containers of a sort of industrial process. And now that in container, in my mind, has kind of been opened up and designed for people to come in or to look out. So, you know, seeing in, seeing out, more transparent, more accessible, more inclusive. Um, a lot of the, the the challenges we come up against in some of these existing buildings is how do you how do you get a wheelchair in this building? Um, and and f so for me, it's this kind of changing of the of the in, of the kind of environment and and there's the story is popping up everywhere as as everyone i'm sure is aware at the moment and it's just that how do you make these the existing ones work better and and what do you do when you when you do something new um oh stage stage one preparation brief for us um i think this is this is this is a photo taken uh, up in Brora when we were first starting out on, the, on our clean lease project. And um, we did this with a, a company called um, BRC, uh, Diageo and the Client. And what I thought was quite amazing about this is what absolutely everybody was involved in day one. Um, BRC organised a, a charrette, um, which for me, for, for me, everyone was there. The client was there. Um, folk from the distillery were there all the design team were there everyone was part of that initial workshop um everyone got their say everyone got to input um and just how how important it is that these projects are not this is not just about us i'm showing the nice images and things like that but this is very much a collaborative approach um from 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 this early stage, Jason, <laughs> we are aware that particularly in distilled projects, the importance of brand, the importance of the visitor. Um, so I don't know if you have similar kind of thoughts about that, but to me, it's got to be a, a, about everybody at the very beginning. And and this year it was amazing because not everyone needs to understand a plan, not everyone needs to understand all the technicalities. It's more about just having that input and having that awareness from from that. Everyone buys into that principle on 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 day one. Absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, the best brands of the world where are the ones that are uh, the same all the way through. So if the, the design team and the creative team involved can all understand everything right from the outset, I think that's a great start. I mean, I'd said to you before this call that the reason Stuart's going first is because nine times out of ten architects are already in place by the time we we get involved and that inevitably causes a delay because we'll have a different view on them on the, the whole space, which would have been much more helpful if we've been involved right at the start. In fact, the ones where we are involved, along with architects, right at the start, we find there's a much smoother run of those projects. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I don't know if anyone can spot the striding man here, but this wasn't the final photo taken of us. Because no one's Johnny looking. Walker. This is Mr. Johnny Walker here. Well, it's actually not. This is our ex-director, uh, ex Brendan, uh, who I just I just managed to catch him in this moment, and I just thought it's the perfect striding man, so I dropped him in. <laughs> um, so moving on, um, the first thing we really start doing when we get to the site is analysing it. And again, for the architects on the call, uh, they'll be familiar with these kind of diagrams, just understanding what's going on. I think that these are images from, from uh, Glen Kinche, just um, in, in near Edinburgh, where this is what you kind of start with. Here's the reality. You know, what what, what are the challenges? What are, the, what are the, the things we need to look at? Where are the opportunities? You know, very, very simply, you know, what, what, are the, what do we need to, what can we open up? Where's the possibilities here? So you can see, you know, obviously this, uh, the, those of those who have been to Glen Kinchy recently, you know, the, the, the kind of working and the, and the bit we really want to celebrate is pretty much hidden away. You can't get to it. It's all about the, the, the journey through the garden at, at Glen Kinchy. And this wasn't really, the reality at the beginning of this project so it's a very much a, a looking at what you have and looking at where the where the challenges and and, and where the the opportunities are um as as with a lot of things Just. 
So, and then of course, um, we look at the history uh, at the same time where this is some of the historical analysis from Port Ellen, which was a distillery that was then, some, it's been through a, a series of changes throughout the years. Um, and again, very interesting for us just to see what happened, what it was in the past when we did a community consultation on the island absolutely fascinating to hear some of the stories of people who had worked there for like 50 years and some of the, you know just the, uh, how that how that's evolved so it's cr absolutely critical that we understand these historic stories again jason this absolutely taps into the to the brand and, and the history and the story behind it which is which is so interesting if nothing else oh, abs uh, totally um i think also you will find having designed a number of distilleries that there's a, a similarity between every one and also the process is virtually identical. So absolutely mm. anything that you can cling on to that's true, interesting, uh, should really be brought to the fore because otherwise you really are just talking about copper and wood, which we've done a lot of times before. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, from moving from, from here, now, one of the unique things that we've found in some of our projects uh, on in this uh, particular sector is that this drawing on the left is actually a drawing that we were given as the brief. Um, and what I think that shows you is the important, this is very unusual in terms of a, an architecture project, um, is a process drawing. So things have to go next to things, kit has to go next to kit. This has to work as a function of building. This can't just be a, a nice idea. So the first thing we do is we get this drawing on the left as we then try and turn it into something that we understand uh, in terms of three dimensions and, and make sure that from the beginning that is absolutely built into the design of this, this project. Um, and I think that is quite unusual for us is that we are given a drawing to start with uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the, the process. So, the exciting bit, I suppose you could say, um, where lots of things happen simultaneously and then we move into the concept. So we've got all this information, analysed the site, um, we understand the constraints, we know where the opportunities are. So what, what do we start doing? Again, um, we like doing some sketches. We believe that um, I know I know everything is technical these days and digital, but you know just the value of of a sketch and working things out quickly, working things out at a large scale, uh, zooming it down. You know all of these things are absolutely critical. I remember when I used to work next to next to you, Jason. You would be constantly filling a sketchbook week on week, um, and and just how important that is actually to, to to that creative process. And I was involved in some of the sketches of this, not these sketches, but me and your colleague um, sat down at Ian McLeod and talked about the layout and argued over the layout of this quite a few times before we got <laughs> to the, the stage. There's a lot of big markers and big sheets of paper, so I guess and you can identify, you can know who's involved. And and these sketches are not just intended to be to be to look nice, but but even at this stage, we're starting to think about how the ventilation strategy might work, which we can't ignore. And the sooner you deal with these things, the better. Um, so again, you can see how we've been talking about views in, views out. Everyone wants to see the stills, but also what do you see from the stills? Um, it's all about that experience every every step of the way. Um, I know you'll often have the, te the, the process guys will be in and they'll say, no, we want the stills here, right at the back, yeah. most efficient here. And there's a little bit of an argument there, or a discussion. Uh, discussion. Uh, a discussion. About how <laughs> important, discussion. important it is for uh, the stills to be in a certain place. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is a wee uh, di couple of diagrams for Port Ellen. Um, you can see we start putting the thing in the machine pretty much at the same time. So you're testing the sketch, you're testing the 2D, the 3D, the sections. Then you start to give it a little bit of reality. What does it mean when you are looking at the surroundings? How do you deal with deliveries, car parking, all the really fun stuff? Um, things we can't ignore, things we have to deal with. Um, and then as we're doing this, we start to consider the massing, appropriateness, the diagramming, and the form kind of starts to come together. So we just got to make sure we're constantly checking back in all these times that whatever we're doing still works with this basic processing and this understanding that this is a, essentially an industrial process that has to work um, and that's really just critical to us um, going back to that repeating thing constantly checking in um, this is one of Jason's actually uh, or certainly one of your colleagues Jason and I, and, I, and I kept this and I think it's really important because again we've got to simultaneously be remembering that whilst we're thinking about all this fun stuff like car parking and deliveries and 
servicing and all the rest of it. Um, th this brand journey is top of the list and it's still there and absolutely works within whatever we are doing. So it's just, uh, I put this in the wall for a long time because it was just to say, right, here at the end of the day is also about, it's got to work as a process building, but what ha what is this visitor doing? What, what, how are they going around this building? You know, how, how does it work? What is the sequence? Um, don't know if you want to comment there, Jason, but it's... No, uh, totally. I mean, it's, it's worth remembering. It is, a, it is a kind of struggle or a kind of... Uh, a, friction that there often is between uh, production and marketing. So marketing are going to be stumping up quite a lot of the budget for these uh, places, all the public spaces so are, are coming from marketing. So they do have quite a strong say in how things work. So yeah, this kind of this journey is really, really important as I kind of hinted at earlier for everybody to agree on. So we will suggest things, we'll suggest mad things to the process guys and nine times out of 10, they're pretty flexible and they'll kind of say, well, we can change things around so that, I mean, one of our big, uh, uh, things is the ATEX environment. So explosive environments and are, from a customer's point of view, we like it that you, you're able to take a photograph all the way through, even up at the stills. And that that is often a little bit of a shock to uh, working with, uh, to, to ensuring that this journey works well and that the technical side of the distillery works well too. And it, also that it doesn't explode and nobody gets killed, which is always, <laughs> always top of your list. Worth avoiding, yes. Yeah. Um, so from here we start to we've obviously been thinking about the space plan but we're really starting to push in towards you know the next kind of level um what goes next to what um what has to go next to what how do you how do you lay things out and just then still, still thinking about that main still house now i said earlier that kind of the industrial process now things have changed a little bit but essentially that industrial process is now becoming into one big container as opposed to smaller buildings and so what can you do with that big container how how can you make that interesting how can you really enhance that that journey and, and that that process um which is kind of represented in, the, in this section of rosebank here um and then of course um even at this early stage, we've got to be thinking about sustainability. We know it's a word that's banded about all the times. We don't really have a choice anymore. Um, it's got to be forefront of our thinking. So it's got to it's got to be integral to everything we do from 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 early from the from the embodied carbon and and what it what is used, what how much carbon is spent on on actually building the thing, and then it's operational carbon and and. and how much does it use to run? If you if you don't think about this early, and I'm sure everyone on, on the call would un, understand that that when you try to bolt it on later on, a it's more expensive, and b it's it's more of a it's it's more of a statement and not really the reality. Um, so we're asking ourselves lots of hows at this point. Um, how's it ventilated? How do we reuse the water? Um, how do we reuse the heat? How do we keep it cool? Um, there's a lot of challenges, but but also a lot of opportunities. How do you, how can you reuse that heat and pass it into other other buildings that are on the site, for instance? I don't know how much of that, Jason, is part of your thinking, but I mean, it's, I think it's... The, the last project I show will will kind of show kind of quite a lot of how how, how we can almost do it at the other end, you know. So I think we'll. I can talk about then. Also, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Stuart. That's fine. I'll crack on. Uh, we do some sketch renders at this point and, and hope that everyone likes it and have a wee lie down and, and job done for, for this stage. We use the produce into, into a report um, for kind of client sign off. Um, so stage three, develop design. Now, the next this is the next sort of series of hoops that we need to go through. Uh, and the following page is really set out a set of planning, a planning package, set of proposals really, when you're formalizing everything, pulling all the ideas and concepts together into one kind of formal package. So the site plans, plans, sections, elevations, uh, you need to confirm what materials you're using, you need to have the drainage all worked out, heritage statements, anything that you need, any consultant documents really <laughs> um, comes into this stage of the of the design. Your job really here is, is to get that design approval, get the from local authority, get the buy-in and, and and some of the larger jobs over a certain area, you're you're doing community consultation as well. Actually, some of the jobs with we've done with the Azure, they've been very keen to engage the community even if they don't, um, strictly speaking, have to, because it's all about making sure not just the design team and all, all the people I mentioned earlier are involved, but also the local community. You can't you can't ignore them. They have to be brought, brought on as part of that. They are so integral to a lot of these projects. So um, again, that I've, we've, we've been doing a few of them recently and, and they're always interesting. Um, and then you start polishing your renders at this stage. So you can see that they've gone up a wee notch from, from the sketch renders that we produced. And, and again, looking to get them in a report and kind of sign everything off, signing everything off, making sure everything's within cost, which is always the easy bit, um, and taking it from there. So technical design. 
moving swiftly now. Um, everything looks great. Everyone's happy. Um, how do you make it work? How do you make it stand up? Um, lots of hows again. Um, how's it insulated? What's the cladding? What's the glass, etc. All that sort of stuff. You're then just adding that next layer of technical detailing on. Um, again, intrinsic that everyone is singing from the same um, song sheet here. You've got the engineer services. You can't you can't forget about all the process gear. All of that stuff has to come together at a stage. So it's that for me. This distillery projects have that extra layer of kind of technical complication in terms of the. These, the, the, this processing kit and this industrial process that has to work on top of what you would usually have to deal with in, in a, a typical kind of architectural project. Um, here's some typical technical drawings. Those some of you much may be familiar with. Um, different scales. Uh, just the key again, coordination at this stage, making sure that your services and your structure and your architecture is all working together. Um, I suppose, Jason, this is probably the stage that we have least probably crossover with yourselves, but it's still got to work. We still yeah. can't be doing things that mean then the brand journey can't work or doors in the wrong places and all the rest of it. So this is the kind of reality sets in to say, right, how does this actually work um, and, and, and how do we do it? Just drawing everything as much detail as possible, but not taking it too far that um, there, there, there isn't any flexibility in it. Um, quite often, this, these are some of the sketches from Glenkinchy actually, where we had to try bring everyone along on the principle of how we do things and and the and how we protect existing timber floors. We want to keep all these this historic uh, importance of the building and just how we bring that up to modern standards and make it safe. Um, so actually, these these three D details were used to help the contractor to help um, actually building standards. Really appreciated it because they just instantly understood what was going on. Um, so that that's why that was the purpose of these. And I threw this drawing in. That's the it's a drawing of the state at Hendricks because even though it's a technical drawing, it does quite a few things. Uh, it kind of embodies the whole brand. Um, you get a view of the stills. There's access required for maintenance, and we're always thinking about the brand. So you can see the kind of Hendricks uh, logo uh, set within the the balustrading here. Um, so even one technical drawing still can be. We're still thinking about a lot of things and not just how the thing is built. Um, construction, again, just moving through things quickly. The moment of truth, I like to call it. Um, when things start coming out the ground and you hope that whatever you've drawn is actually uh, close to the reality of the situation, there's always a lot of technical queries, a lot of things come up on site that are unexpected, especially when you're working with existing buildings. This was a, a scary day when they took the building down around the existing chimney, um, hoping that it was all going to stand up. Um, so the, the, it's a nervous time, there's no, no, no denying it. Um, what is amazing is to see something that you quite often you've been drawing for years actually coming out of the ground. Um, big difference here from in my mind, Jason, is that from interiors to exteriors, or uh, is that is the speed, um, the scale and the speed. You know, at which things are produced and things get completed and then start again. Um, I don't know if it's the same with yourself, but quite often the drawings we do it can be for years before we see anything out of the ground and and. Uh, in my mind, there's a sort of quicker turnover for for you, you draw something and it's built. Certainly, the interiors guys in our office, they get through a few projects by the time we've done one. You know. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, yeah. Unless we're involved in architect, and we we have to just work to your pace. If we're, which ideal, the ideal situation is we start, but there's lots of gaps. You know, so yeah. then it's a case of managing like you have a gap and it's like where were we? What were we doing? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's a uh, it's useful. To, uh, to keep it's good to have time but also there's challenges too yeah so here's some images of Glen Kinchy um where you can see how the importance of this garden and really you know don't forget that the landscaping needs to be bedded in early to make sure that when the time the building's finished it's all in the right you know it's all looking good so still a lot going on at this stage and then eventually um, again another sharp intake of breath and you get to sort of completion handover stage where you take all the fancy photos um, with nobody in them, which is always the way with architects. They like a photo with no people. Um, here are just some of the, the completed images. Um, this is Hendrix, some of the labs. Um, it was got a quirky project, this, it's fair to say. Um, this is Kinchy, not quite bedded in in terms of landscaping. Um, I don't know how many of you have, uh, on the call have been here, but it's definitely worth a visit. Um, some of the interiors at Glen Kinchy. Uh, this is Klein Leash, which is not long completed as well. Where again, different kind of project where we're where we're um, 
different different uh, different uh, different age of existing buildings fair to say um and, and what could we do to to really just enhance the the existing provision that they had and then i think the the, the stage i chopped off earlier but the, the bit that architects like to forget about but is absolutely critical is is in use and feedback and we're always learning we're always learning lessons and just make sure that 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 is absolutely forefront of of our mind is that when we hand the baby over and we're exhausted it's just still to say well it, it, it lives on um i was going to draw comparisons between that and whiskey but uh it's it's you could draw comparisons between most things but um i think it's just important to say how important that is and, and again jason i think it's probably quite a good good time to pass over to yourself in terms of that what is the actual experience at the end of the day and, and, and just how important that is that was great. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, right, I'll take over. Right, hopefully this will work. Can we all see that? Yep, I can see that, Jason. So yeah, um, that's great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Stuart. And yeah, it's a shame that we can't show a lot of the, the work that we've been working on with Michael Laird over the last few years. Um, but um, what I was hoping to talk about was like what we do beyond the design of the distillery. We, we obviously do a lot of the environments, um, but um, and I'll sh we'll show you some of them. But also, what's surprising to what has been surprising to me recently and is on the increase is like how much other things there are out with out with just the environment, and that's in order to create a great um, experience from our point of view. Um, obviously, there yeah, I can choose myself. So this is a little bit about us. This is our our world, if you like. We. Um, there's about 35 of us. We're in Edinburgh and Glasgow, mostly, mostly in Edinburgh. But our, we, we, 90 percent of our work is in the drinks industry, and we do everything from brand strategy right the way through to packaging and secondary packaging, which also includes uh, within their distillery design and experience design. Uh, so here's some of our kind of notable projects. 25 um, percent of just for lockdown, about, I think about 25 percent of our work was in the in the states. Um, and we do, we do work for most of the major drinks brands all around the world. A little bit about Contagious, about what we believe. We we believe, like similar to our clients, we believe there's nowhere to hide any longer, that we really have to be as authentic as possible. Um, we And if we can be as authentic as possible, then this is great for the consumer, the brand and society itself. We believe in a, in a shared spirit. This is something that an emotional alignment with our brands or our customers. Uh, and what that helps us to do is really kind of get on the same page with our customers, make sure that there's no um, skeletons in the closet, that we all get to the real truths about the uh, um, about the project. And also we don't act like dicks, which is quite a good thing. Nobody likes to work with a dick. Um, so what this means for the project is like, we want to find and express purpose for every project, challenge the status quo and take the cleanest line. Now take the cleanest line, I think is something that you probably wouldn't have seen in anybody's manifesto 10 years ago, but it's something that we continually um, we is coming as Stuart had mentioned with uh, uh, the environmental um, uh, emphasis, but everything I think everything has to begin. You have to really do the right thing. We believe that results in emotional engagement, and this is going to for the brand, for the category, for the world, which is a big claim. But you know, um, as we've discovered our debt recently, we are uh, easily global now. And then, how do we measure these things, and how do we prove things? Because quite a lot of the time, when we're doing work at distilleries. And the interest, the increased interest in distilleries and how products are made is really to kind of how we measure, how we prove that this is what our products are do. The, this is our, our 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 lot. This is just like a Tuesday morning, quite a formal crew, but we're all drinking. Um, so you'll often see, we often have contractors in the office and they're like, God, how come everybody's got a ball at their desk? What's wrong with you guys? So um, I think that, um, but they're often, it's, I mean, it's, that's kind of as close to the brand as you get really is the bottle. So having that in your uh, in most people's desk is really important so to kind of mirror Stuart the kind of one of the most important things about us is really right at the start almost before the brief comes to and this is for all of our projects whether they're packaging or uh, distilleries but really defining our kind of brand experience is really important for us because everything falls out of there so one of the best things that ever happened was we I was in a bar I was in Devil's Advocate in Edinburgh and we're doing this thing like with a bartender on the right kind of going to tell us what your favorite whiskey is God, we want your favorite whiskey and he immediately went to Glengoyne 21 and he said and we said oh right why is that he said well do you realize that they 
they are the slowest distilled whisky in Scotland, in the world, that they uh, go to Jerez, they take real care of the wood that the casks are made in, that's 100% sherry matured, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he gave us this great big uh, kind of uh, speech about it. And I was like, oh, God, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, I'd been on the tour at Glengoyne, which we were instrumental in designing. So for us, this is complete in the circle. Um, it's really, uh, I fed this back to our team, like Glenn, our, our designers, but also like our clients, because it's not just us. Everybody been working towards telling the story. So effectively, we're starting at the end, really. This is kind of, um, if you if you take Stuart's slide about um, our distilleries and our brand home experiences in use, this is kind of, this is the, the ideally the end use. We want to create advocates, and there's no better advocate than an expert bartender who's going to convince you to buy a very expensive um, uh, Glen Goyne, 21 year old Glen, Glen Goyne, but he did, he told a great story. We got to feed that back to our customers. Uh, it was the easiest expenses I ever had to get signed up. <laughs> um, so, um, so what we want to do is really, back, to emphasize this point, articulate what our brand stands for. It's not just about logos and et cetera, et cetera. What do they actually mean? So in the background, we're, we're looking at uh, absolute elix now. What's unique about them is it's a vodka and what they say is copper makes it better. It's often handcrafted in Sweden. So everything comes from there. Everything falls out of what the brand meaning is. And that may well be like Stuart alluded to, what is the history of the site and the building, et cetera. Um, it may be one of a billion things, but if you can pinpoint that and like Stuart said right at the start, if everybody agrees, this is what we're working towards. Everything becomes so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. Then, yeah, yeah understanding what your target audience wants. So that's really important to us. It's important that we know less so than ever. People don't live in a bubble. People are having lots of different experiences. They have experiences on the high street in bars, et cetera, when they buy things, when they go to the Apple store, what their phone looks like, et cetera. So whatever you do has to chime in and directly related to them. You have to kind of take that on board. So these are the Hendrix guys, kind of how they look at it. And you kind of, you can put that right next to some of the, the the distillery building that Stuart showed earlier, and you can see there's a common thread right the way through, and they're kind of really great with how they communicate their brand. So we think when we're designing a, a, an experience at a distillery, we have to consider every step of the journey. So we have to have a story. So like, what better story uh, than uh, this one? So uh, I hope you can. Uh, uh, this is kind of a, this is a very professional. Uh, uh, story um uh, see if anybody can identify it so uh certain little young woman called cinderella has an awful life evil sisters but she goes to the ball and dances with the prince etc and then oh things go badly but then at the end things go better so we use the story as an analogy to kind of say when we're designing a distiller designing a visitor journey that we it doesn't all have to be there can be ups and downs and kind of different different sort of things happening along the way and that's what makes for a good story and you can tell it in lots of different ways for example at bombay sapphire the white and this graph these these are all the kind of areas that we went through the white on the graph represents the architecture it was a listed build a series of listed buildings so when you arrive this should be the emphasis and only like two percent of it should really be about bombay sapphire but by the time you get to the bar well, 98% of it should really be about uh, Bombay Sapphire and what you're drinking. And actually the architecture and the interiors, that kind of fades into the background. So there's a different sort of brief for these areas. Also, it was a, in terms of a sensory journey, these different colors diff represent senses. So, you know, when you're in a gallery space, it's really all about sight. Excuse me, but when you're in a dry room where you're, you're, you're playing with ingredients, et cetera, that's more about smell and feel. So we'll, we'll look at the customer journey in a number of different ways. And this is quite clever because then we just took those straight things and turned them into circles. See graphic designers. <laughs> and then uh, kind of uh, so we can tell and then we'll add into these kind of little uh, this customer journey, you know, wh how people should not should be feeling, but how we'd want them to feel like inspired to create to elevate in certain places. And this is a really good starting point for us, because if you can understand how people should you would want them to feel and how that relates to the brand at each point, then it's a good starting point for each. Uh, each each part. I think that's uh, well, well, fascinating, Jason. I think it'd be great if you could do those diagrams for us as well. That'd be brilliant. No problem. We'll have a chat. How to make a, how to make a graph look nice. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what do you want your takeouts to be? Increasingly, you know, we'll often, well, we've had situations where, you know, if somebody's got a bad TripAdvisor uh, review, we're like, oh God, we've got a meeting with them tomorrow. They're going to be, they're going to be really pissed off because it's more and more important. Their TripAdvisor reviews are really important and their online presence is really important. Like I told, I hinted at earlier, it's important for us to 
decide that you can take photographs all the way through because that's increasingly important. And how does that work? You know, people want to make an emotional connection. This is at the Guinness storehouse and most people take pictures of this painted gate. Now, God knows how many millions of pounds Diageo spent on the Guinness storehouse over the years. I don't know if they're happy or not that people take pictures of this painted gate. Certainly the person on the top right isn't that happy. But um, everybody, everybody here does this picture and it makes this kind of, uh, it's all over their social media, which is like somebody probably would never accounted for, through, but it's now a kind of key asset for them. So pinpoint the reasons why everything is there. And this is really back to telling the story and how you tell it. And one of the things you have to realize is your customers will come in uh, to a tour as paddlers, swimmers and divers, you know, so that means different levels of knowledge. So each point of the story, you'll have to have a different message and that will have to be built into the interpretation. So, you know, what can what will a paddler understand compared to a diver? And they, these groups will often be mixed together. So you better be prepared for that. Uh, tell the truth. So this is why uh, this is kind of why we have a man manifesto for Contagious is and what I hinted at is like, you can't hide now. Like in a digital age, everything is exposed. So everything has to has to be about the truth. Like this is a stave tunnel we did for Aberfeldy. And it, this, the client was a bit worried it was gonna be a bit Disney. Um, but you know, staves are uh, made, that's what make casks. Casks are responsible for 60% of the flavor and all the color in whiskey. You know, so there's a truth there. If we'd made this stave, uh, stave tunnel out of baguettes, then it wouldn't have made any sense and it would have been stupid. But to have a truth, the truth running through everything um, kind of really helps with everything we do. So I'm going to mirror um, Stuart's one uh, a bit here with the design process, but you'll find they're pretty much similar in terms of um, uh, what they show. This is for Angel's Envy, and this is the kind of the main reason probably why we have so much work in America now, because it's a Bacardi owned bourbon. And we did, we we want a pitch to work at their brand home in, in Louisville about five years ago. And uh, this is just a little bit of an explanation of um, of how we did it. So broadly the same sort of concept design. You'll see the customer journey here in black. You know, so it's about Lincoln Henderson who started it all off at the start. And then it's much more about the drink, the Angel's Envy towards the end of the tour. We're looking at kind of key images here in the bottom left, a lot of precedents for of how it should look. In this case, it should be involved a lot of timber because it's still it's mature extra matured in timber um, and then bottom right you know how how other people are doing it you know kind of how the high line interprets itself you know how mass brothers chocolate does so we're looking around the world as to for inspiration at this point like Stuart said as well we have almost got a blanket ban on CAD and um, computer generated visuals at a concept stage we will always want to try and produce sketches at this stage and you'll see from these sketches you know this tasting area if so but would then can we just cut a tree down and have a tasting table made out of a, a, a big a, a piece of a piece of an oak tree um yeah so these kind of sketches are really useful also i think at the start clients are much more happier to feed into them if you show them a visual at the start they kind of feel oh is it all finished now oh do i not get a say so the sketches are useful from that point of view. I don't know if you feel the same, Stuart, with Yeah, you. it pretty, pretty much is always that question of what, what do we show at what stage, but that early stage of concept, like you say, there's, it feels like it's more accessible to people to change something because then you can just scribble over it and do it again, you know. So, no, absolutely, Jason, same same sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then design development, we're just finding the visuals are getting slightly sharper. Um, we're starting to draw things to scale to make sure that they work, but we're still keeping uh, materials in there we're kind of saying look we're pretty sure this is going to be this material now this is it in situ but that might be in an elevation some things are going to end up in visuals but you can't capture everything so you know we'll often have technical drawings that are kind of half technical half illustration at that point you know that graphic of Lincoln is going to be roughly this size in reception there's a person next to it people are starting to get an idea of how things uh, will will work at this stage. We're still having a kind of sketchy kind of quality in here because you're still allowed a few changes at this point, but we're pretty much decided that things are uh, on the you know on the way. And I think yeah, that's the illustration of that little sketch in the bottom there, kind of like right. We're not going to update the whole visual, but we're going to update the sketch just to kind of show these couple of changes you made there, etc. But our kind of elevations will have kind of will be pretty much accurate according to what we're going to do. And then the technical development, I'm not going to go into these drones. They're kind of just smaller scaled versions of what Stuart showed and we don't have to keep the rain out. Um, and but I suppose the difference is we can uh, we can now draw in feet and inches because we draw because we work in America now. So that's the right top of our CB. Um, but, you know, technical technical drawings throughout a drawing pack. Most people on the call hopefully will understand how these work. Things are becoming really precise now. This is about communicating with contractors and 
third parties so that they can build actually build this stuff and get it um, especially doing work remotely we have to make sure that our drone packs are like of the highest standards so that nothing's missed out because we can't do every site set uh, site visit in america we have to have a technical partner out there or a management partner out there who can do that along with us so and then implementation uh, yeah the, the the building wasn't even built at this stage so we'd kind of done all this work and this was it getting uh, built out there so it was great to be part of that we were able to make uh, changes and it was kind of a weird situation we often get a situation where we get concept signed off with all those kind of loose sketches and then the very first the very next day they're like yeah but where's your plumbing drone because the building's marched on they need to kind of put the plumbing in you know and it's like oh wow god think about that now so that's often a bit of a shock to the system but we kind of start to expect it now so how does it look in the end you know you know, we started as a branding agency, a graphics agency. So obviously how the brand is represented through graphics is incredibly uh, important to us to get every detail right. Lincoln Henderson here, you know, there's a the guy on, who started it all, came out of retirement, but also on the right, these are reclaimed bits of timber from the refurbishment of the, of the distillery. And then we've added personal notes into there. That's a note from his son, Wes Henderson, which is right at the entrance. So we make sure that Lincoln and his son are right at the entrance, and that's really important. In terms of uh, the architecture and our relationship to architecture, this building used to be an elevator, um, that's a lift um, factory. Uh, and so we've used, the, in order to hold all the kind of trestles and graphics up at the top, we've used all elevator fittings and everything to hold those up. So we're, we're trying to be respectful of the building and the kind of heritage of the building as well. Um, then the, you'll see that the renders of the, uh, the kind of point of sale and how it's dovetailed in because they're a craft band that we have to take that through. Uh, to every detail there and there's the log table so it made it it made it's like uh, Stuart kind of uh, <laughs> call Stuart talked about doing a concept and then kind of clinging on to as much of it as you possibly could uh, yeah. towards the end so we were just delighted that that um, table uh, made it right the way through it was um, it was the um, called by the contractor the most expensive tasting table in the world not because uh, a lump of oak isn't actually that expensive but in order to um, upgrade all of the structure around that part of the building was quite expensive so uh, sorry about that um and then how we um how do you talk about the process in an interesting way so that's a pie chart really it's full of different parts of grain but you can lift up the grain stick it in the stick it in the grinder and then you can chuck it into the distilling process so you've helped make angels envy so you're involving the customer at all points there's our yeah, we didn't specify that gloss finish on the uh, on the uh, that just that's one of those things that slipped through the net when you turned up on site and you're like, oh, gloss is it? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like okay, um, <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, um, how do you uh, how do you you know express in the brand and the key points? You know, you're gonna have time to pause here. You know, you're really kind of a market uh, kind of display of the with the brand very subtly in the background. But again, uh, adherence to the to the to how it's made. So the the whole of the front of the bar is made out of uh, limestone and the water in that area is filtered through limestone to make the product. So you're always trying to refer back to how things are made. And then kind of digital, increasingly there's digital aspects of our projects uh, now. So those are kind of automatically built in. And then we like to kind of increasingly like to increase, uh, kind of have some results uh, as to how things have worked here. I'm kind of moving on, I'm presuming I'm kind of over time and normally am. So broader distillery, um, so, um, it's actually the neighbour distillery of Clinelish. Uh, is Clinelish? Clinelish. Yeah. So it's it's literally a hundred yards from uh, the distillery that um, MLA have worked on, but we've worked on Brora, which is its neighbour. Now this is kind of super high end, high net worth individuals. Um, it's not really something you can buy a tour on. You kind of have to be invited into this place. But I'll show you a little bit about beyond uh, the the distillery, how this. How, how it kind of works from our point of view more as a brand agency than an interior design agency so this is obviously before it's before you know so um uh, this is uh it, it, the story is a bit of a state to start with and this is after these are just kind of iphone snaps at the moment but everything in this uh the, the, again we've got we've got we've self part yourself kind of a flagellation thing about creating very heavy wood tasting tables which we've done at the back there but every single aspect of this, we were responsible. It's very traditional, but it's incredibly uh, high, uh, high, high level of kind of spend per square meter in here. And the, so it's a very, uh, I think it's kind of like really good sort of traditional, value, right for the kind of customer and right for the brand at this point. But just, I think the, the one of the most interesting things about this project is the depth that we've had to go into kind of behind the scenes. So they insisted that the furniture was all reclaimed, that we got it all refurbished. So starting from here back and then 
this is be seated just around the corner of where I'm at now in Edinburgh, get that all, all done, that the, all the signage was inlaid with gold leaf. And uh, gold leaf is great because it doesn't tarnish. It's slightly more expensive, but it's a really good material to use. We also were responsible for designing and sourcing the, the, the glassware and the jackets that you would get when you're up on site there. A whole bunch of other stuff that I'm not allowed to show, but here's a kind of short list of what we were also responsible for. My favourites there are the salmon fly brooch and also the hand sanitizer, <laughs> which is like, uh, I don't know, every was every the studio was obviously fighting to design the hand sanitizers at that point. But you, the gate in the background, we designed that gate about 500 times before we got it right. Um, so if you're working with the brand, so you get it right and then you kind of go, all right, but then it doesn't work from a practical point of view. So that, that circular thing that Stuart's talked about there. Also their campaign, these visuals, you know, the key visual, this visual takes forever. You'll, you'll never get that view in real life because it doesn't exist. Um, and that cat, that wasn't one photograph. That was a four, about 400 photographs comped together. You know, lifestyle photography, how, how it all works together. Their tasting kit, that was really important in lockdown. How they appear in a retail environment, etc. So Macallan Distillery, again, a really important piece of architecture. Sorry, Stuart, that none of your architecture is in here. Um, awesome. um, but we've been working to make this a kind of more of a, a different type of experience. We've interpreted how they own this kind of cast to glass uh, process. So how do we interpret that? We've been refurbishing a lot of the things they had in, in there already. And then they had a, a, an amazing, uh, amazing uh, uh, warehouse, kind of super high tech warehouse. So we helped them design this bar in the middle, which there are six par parts of that bar, which expresses the six important pillars of Macallan. And also we designed the light show that went along with it. The light show they had was far too long, so we edited it down so that as you went in, the story really unfolded. You get closer and closer to this glass of whiskey. Um, and then we, so this is kind of like the real key moment. We also designed it so the bar could be taken to bits. Uh, each element had a battery in it, so it could always be glowing, even though it was independent. So you could have different styles of tasting. Or at the time when we were designing, it was really important for social distancing. And we've just finished their retail there as well. So I'll just run through them. But um, interestingly, from the point of view of Macallan, they now don't talk about tours any longer. They just talk about experiences. They see the retail as more of a gallery type of space. Um, I think the cheapest experience you can do at Macallan is 50 quid, and the, then it goes up to 250. But this, the, the, their core customer is really not so much about people who come and do an experience there. It's about people who they invite, they know what they're going to buy, they're going to buy tens of thousands of pounds worth of whiskey. So those are our target market. So this is really, one. Of, that's why one of the briefs, it's not traditional type of retail, but they wanted to be able to display as much of their product in this wall as possible, which is in a process to do, and this is an early, early photograph, and for it to be flexible. So this now, this space now looks completely different according to the campaign that they're running uh, just now. But everything about it had to kind of, so this is this uh, mid floor unit is the shape of the river Spey which is where their logo comes from. And we've highlighted all the different parts of the spay along it. And that is kind of their kind of impulse buy product. And then if you spend over, you look like you're going to spend over a certain amount, you can go into the VIP room next to the retail area and buy it there. We noticed in the press yesterday, we've, we just did these graphics for the, uh, for the shop front, if you like, for their Christmas display. It's also the bottom of the tree. And I noticed very cleverly, they've mimicked the graphic and the color of the bulbs in the tree, uh, which is very good. And put a little Easter egg he's house on top which is lovely. Um, and just finally, uh, I thought I'd show this. This is really interesting because this is kind of distilleries and beyond. And back to what Stuart was saying about sustainability. Um, Absolute have got, they think they've got one of the most sustainable distilleries in the world. It was, when it was built, it was deliberately neck built so that you could get the product via ship. It's hugely insulated. Everything they can for the distillery is, is supplied within a three mile ra radius. So um, what they wanted to do now is to educate the bartender into what their kind of sustainability uh, message. So one of the things we did was at the Athens Beer, Sh Athens uh, Spirit Show, we went over there, we arranged, this is about what I mean about the difference between experience and design. We designed the hustle buggy, which is the bottom left and the helmet in the bottom right. Um, and th we, uh, the guys went out there just before the, uh, the exhibition and they went around all the key accounts, the best bars in Athens and collected all their citrus waste and then we uh, worked with an Australian recycled cocktail company so that when the bartenders all came to the exhibition, all this waste was kind of recycled into stoos, which is a component of a cocktail. And we made recycled cocktails. At the, so we designed the stand, 
Uh, and we made these recycled cocktails and we also educated them about not only can you make stew out of recycled product, you can make cleaning products for your bar and everything. It's all about sustainability. Star of the show was, was like the cheapest thing. It's just like a helmet, which is a disco ball. But that is kind of, that's also part of the brief is like, how do you make sustainability uh, a cool, interesting thing and not just about, you know, sandals and bad cheese. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's a little bit from me. Um, I think I should stop sharing it. I've got no idea how much time I've taken to do that. But. That's that's no problem. It was highly, highly interesting and entertaining. So thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, if you want to ask questions to... Oh, we've got five minutes. I know, sorry. <laughs> so if you want to ask questions, you can use the chat um, function. And uh, I'll kick off with one question that comes to mind for both, actually. Uh, probably the two different point of, points of view. Obviously, distilleries traditionally, there weren't buildings where visitors would come in. So when this this uh, new uh, uh, requirement of having a visitor experience or a visitor tour comes in, and how did the companies uh, adjust to it? And all of a sudden, all the distilleries, they need to include uh, the opportunity to allow visitors to see what's going on in the buildings. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I'll maybe take that. Uh, yeah, but- sure. I think that's kind of that's something that started in the, in the late 60s, I think, with Glenn Fiddick. I think they were the first ones to do it. Um, and it's grown up since then. I, I think we're in, this is my client's quote, but I think we're in the kind of third generation of uh, uh, brand homes. The first one was like, you turn up, you get a dram, and somebody will show you, a grumpy man will show you a pipe, and that's great. And the second one was like, a little bit, not so grumpy man will take you around, and you can see a distillery, and there's a shop, and you get a panini. So that's like the second generation. Um, you know, scattering over it here. Third generation, I think, is what we're starting to see now is with the likes of McAllen, who kind of say this is an experience. Uh, Glen Turret want a Michelin star restaurant at their at their distillery, and the Johnny Walker experience in Princess Street. You know, it's about creating incredible experiences where people just love the brand. So that 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 brand journey, but like. As Stuart hinted at earlier, it's difficult when sometimes distilleries are 200 years old. Yeah, I think I think there's a big difference, exactly what you're saying there, Jason, a big difference between when you arrive at an existing building versus a new building. Like Port Ellen is a brand new distillery, um, whereas Glen Kinchy is an existing one, which is more of a refurb. But even within a new building now, within the specifics of the distillery aspect, there are situations there where you have a, a basic industrial process and like a grated floor that that is standard in the in the in the process building and how do you make that accessible to to the public so even with a new building you still have that big challenge um but the, the biggest thing for me is when we have an old building we we try and put big holes in it <laughs> um views in and views out like i said earlier when you have a new building there's a lot more glass so for me that's where that generational change is coming is that it's much more i use the word publicized which is the wrong word obviously but the way that it's becoming a lot more public rather than this kind of just industrial process and and it's fascinating for me but it's uh you know just how you maintain the integrity of that whilst having it more on show i suppose you could say yeah right so um i'm not sure how much time i've got left here uh... Oh, here's a question. So we do probably this question, and then if we can cut out, I apologize, but there you go. Uh, Rachel is asking, as an electrical manufacturer with a distillery track record, at which point do you consider the lighting specification, for for example, including the hazardous area products? How do we ensure you get the latest lower consumption, easier maintenance products known to you? Come to the office. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, from, I think <laughs> that's a good technical one for sure. But uh, I think, as Jason mentioned earlier on, again, it's that next layer of, I was going to say complication, but it's more challenge that we have to make sure at any time that you your light fitting in the maturation area is, is ATX fitting, like Jason said, and it does limit you to what you are able to do in that space. So your, the, the skill then becomes what can you, what is then appropriate for, for that space that may, may or may not be in line with the brand, you know, so that becomes a real challenge. Um, the latest lower consumption, easier, main, again, that's just about uh, a kind of constant uh awareness and researching and trying to find the best products uh really from that point of view and again that starts to overlap with yourself jason and in terms of when it gets from architecture to fit out and all the bits in between and who's responsible for that i think the responsibilities between 
Who's 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 doing feature lighting versus emergency lighting? So like we're not get, we're getting into some technical stuff here, but just those crossovers between the two and how that 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 marries in if that. Very quickly, we just uh, if we consult with the health and safety guys at the distillery and we try and push them, they'll automatically go. This is a ATEX room, but it isn't really because ATEX is only like a, a meter or a meter and a half from the still. And we've had clients who used a glass screen in front of the distiller in front of the um, stills. We said, well, if we put the lights here and um, they're no longer atex and you can get rid of the glass screen altogether you can use the money you were going to spend on the glass screen on lights or something you know um so that, that's what i've heard of buildings actually getting bigger and it being cheaper because they didn't have to use atex light things or atex equipment so. okay uh right i've got as i say we keep going until we get cut out then and i apologize for it if we get if you have any questions i'm talking to the our lovely audience maybe you could just drop us an email we're gonna ask um stuart and jason to answer and then put out uh, a little article on our website but the my question was because all throughout your presentations you've been talking about building new buildings, working with old buildings, and a lot of companies that have got 200, 300 years of history that need to be incorporated into the building and the history and the brand journey. But then you also work with brand new stuff. So they, And then you also work, in the case of Hendrix here, with buildings that need to look old, but actually are brand new. So what's your favorite approach? Is that brand new is easier than working with old or old is more fascinating? So what's, what do you enjoy the most? Uh, I think I, I wouldn't have a preference, to be honest. I think there's all there's advantages and disadvantages in, in all of them. I think what I would say is that they always have to relate to the site, to the history, to the context. Um, that's Whether it's new or old, if it's a brand new one, then we take clues from some of the, the old ones on the site. I think with any distillery building, you always find that there is, generally speaking, an existing it's an industrial process, like I said. So there's always warehouses around these sites, for instance. They don't, they're, they're never just blank canvases, um, which you may get with an office or, or something. But um, I don't really have a favourite from that point of view. I, I did a lot of training in, in restoration of historic buildings, so I have a huge admiration for the quality of some of these old buildings. You know, a new building is designed to the last, what, 25, 50 years. Some of these buildings are already 300 years old. So it's it's um, there's obviously a massive push now with the sustainable agenda to reuse existing buildings. And, and the first thing we do at the site, for instance, at Port Ellen is saying, right, what what can we keep? And then what should we keep? Um, what are the most important buildings? What are the ones that are already falling down? Some of the ones at Port Ellen were already so badly deteriorated that they had to come down in any case. It just so happened they were the ones of least value. So so it's more about working with the historic consultants on, on a historic project to say, right, that's worth keeping. We've got justification to remove that because it's already half fallen down in the first place. So like it just depends. And, that, and that's the thing about if it's a distillery building, there's always a an, an interesting history and there's always that local story and connection to, to the kind of place. Um, so no no real preference, I would say, Sarah, but they're all they're all interesting from my point of view. I, I'd agree. I think we I think we'd always strive to do something different each time. I think we often get initial kickback from clients kind of saying, well you've already worked on 40 distilleries. And like, what, am I just another one? It's like, yeah, but if we do the same one every time, then we'll only get to 41, you know? So um, so it's understanding, again, I'll have one, but it's, what does the brand mean and how does that fit into the, that that um, particular building? Like, for example, at Brora, you saw we did something incredibly traditional and we had even source all the right kind of artwork for that. But equally, we'll work on, on old buildings where we'll put something in that feels incredibly contemporary and kind of really jars. Uh, or, or compliments is the right word, isn't it? Not jar. Uh, we're not looking for things to jar. Uh, you know, um, uh, compliments that building and kind of shows that something new has happened in there. Um, I'll be glamorous. We just finished a distillery in Manhattan called Great Jones Distillery, and we worked with uh, uh, artists and designers out there, and we created a, a, a kind of experience in the basement, which was much more akin to, uh, I suppose a bit of contemporary art really it's kind of it's supposed to take people completely by surprise in the basement there so um, that type of thing is uh, sort of trying to kind of pe take people on a journey and kind of introduce things that they didn't expect in a kind of what I think is a 1930s building in, in uh, Soho in Manhattan. Yeah. 
I think that's some of the most interesting, best quality design is where you maybe do get a bit of the unexpected. Maybe you come into something and you just don't expect that, which, which you know, especially for a historic building can be really interesting. And I think from an architecture point of view, you know, the, the kind of word that you alluded to, Jason, about authenticity and about kind of appropriateness. Like, is this actually an appropriate thing to do in this site, even if you're allowed to do it? Mm. Um, so there's just that awareness of, of these things, I think, is is critical. And, and when you work on... Um... Uh, on an ex existing site that you need to, there is a lot of voices you need to put together is the council and the building control and the community and the company itself. So how do you manage to, well, not keep everybody happy because it's impossible, manage to tick the boxes so they actually allow you to go, ha go ahead and b make a beautiful building? If you had another half an hour, Sarah, I would <laughs> I, know, well, I, say, <laughs> uh, I think what I was trying to get at in my presentation, uh, there's, there's, at every stage, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, there's a lot of hoops in your own office to jump through, as I'm sure Jason will agree, is design is such a specific personal thing. Some people will look at some of the stuff we've done and think, oh, I hate that. Uh, that's okay you know it's a person it can be a very personal thing and it's like you're looking at a piece of art you know it doesn't mean it's better or worse it just means it's a, a personal style so that 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 is a challenge in itself and I'm always kind of amazed at the fact that a building has been built in the first place because it is there's so many things to get through and you've just think you've ticked a lot of boxes with some aspect whether it's building standards whether it's planning whether it's the heritage side of things and then a whole other stuff sort of set of things come in and then we've got to be thinking of this so i think when i was listening to what you were saying jason just that ability to be constantly thinking about everything is the is such a key thing um that you're not forgetting about one thing or another and just being mindful and that's why i think we have all these wee reminders and put things in the wall next year and just to say don't just don't forget about this um yeah. so I think you said it there, Stuart, it's always about checking in, checking in with all of these uh, people. And as we said, these, these projects can last for three years, four years, you know. So sometimes we'll find that we have a whole new brand team on the project. You know, so we sold an idea to the first set of people, you know, and then we're already down the road and they're kind of going, why is that blue? And you're like, well, so and so. Well, they don't work it anymore. It's like, well, and then you're, there's a big discussion then. So there is a kind of constant kind of balance and balancing is like, because then, then they're they're not invested in that idea because it wasn't theirs and it, that idea costs ten grand and it's like how can I kind of convince this person that it's the right idea when they weren't in the original discussion? So these are really complicated projects, I think. Uh, and I say there's a whole process technical side on top of that as well, Stuart, which is um, which is um, uh, interesting too. Okay. Right, uh, no more questions from our audience. So thank you very much both for this uh, session. It was really interesting and great fun as well, I must say. <laughs> so um, that's us for this year. We are done. I'll probably see you back early next year uh, and then we'll, we'll pr uh, promote the new topic for our virtual panel as soon as we can. Somebody's clapping their hands, so a happy day. <laughs> One clap, I'm happy. That's fine. Fantastic. So thank you very much again for both and for the audience for staying with us all day. We got hard from Jason. That's lovely. <laughs> uh, Merry Christmas for everybody since we are December already and I shall see you soon. Thank you very much. Cheers, Sarah. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.